Yeah, the frequency of the observer is not going to be the same as the frequency of the source. If the car is moving, then the sound that the car emits is not going to be the same as the sound that Bob hears. Even though it's just one wave traveling outwards, uh, Bob is going to hear a different frequency. And in particular, if the car is moving towards Bob, is Bob going to hear a higher pitch sound or a lower pitch sound? Higher, because it's closer. Yeah. Well, it's not so much about closer or further. Closer or further determines like things like how loud the sound will be. Like if you're further away from the sound source, then it's going to sound quieter. But the pitch, the frequency is all about which direction it's traveling. Is it traveling towards you or away from you? Since the car is traveling towards Bob, the waves end up getting bunched together. So that 300 hertz is higher than the car, the, the sound actually emitted by the car. That is, the observer's frequency is higher than the source's frequency. And that's ultimately because as the car travels, the forward going waves get bunched closer and closer together. Whereas the backwards traveling waves get more and more spread out. Since the car emits a wave, and then the car has traveled a little bit before it emits the next wave. So the waves in front, the wave fronts get bunched closer and closer together, but the waves behind get more and more spread out. Waves closer together means more wave fronts are hitting Bob per second. So that means Bob's going to hear a higher frequency. Any questions on that conceptually so far? So if we want to know what is the sound actually emitted by the car, what is the frequency of the sound emitted by the car's siren? Uh, what equation we could, could we use to figure that out? Uh, um, F observer equals um, the speed over speed plus or minus the speed of the source times FS. Yeah. And what was in the denominator there? Or sorry, the numerator? Um, just V, just the speed. Well, speed plus or minus one other, wasn't it? Oh, I thought you used that one um, only if the observer is moving. Well, let's say, I mean, in general, possibly the source and the observer could be moving. In this particular case, Bob, the observer is not moving. But let's get the general Doppler equation and then we can fill in the details for the specific examples. But if both the observer and oh, okay. the source could be moving, what would the equation look like? So then it would be V plus or minus um, the observer over V plus or minus um, the source. Okay, sounds good. And then V itself would just be speed of the wave, in this case, speed of sound. So in the specific example of Bob, we know that the observer is not moving. So we can say the uh, frequency that Bob hears is the same as the frequency the car creates multiplied by, and we know Bob is not moving, so that's just going to be zero. What about the car's motion? It would be um, negative because this car is moving closer, so we want the denominator to get smaller, so the overall value will be larger. Yeah. And I usually do think about that in terms of, should I expect this to create a larger or smaller result? And if the car is moving towards Bob, the sound waves get bunched together. Bob is going to be getting, going to be receiving more wave fronts per second. That's a higher frequency. So we should expect this multiplier to be more than one. You get a multiplier more than one by having a smaller denominator. So we should expect subtraction in the denominator to make the result uh, smaller sorry, to make the denominator smaller and therefore make the overall result larger. And filling in the details there, we know frequency of Bob is 300 Hertz. 
And what's, what should we use? What's the usual good value for a speed of sound? Speed of sound in air is about how much? We were using 350 yesterday. Yeah. And I think it's usually closer to like 340 or 343 or something like that. I think they were using 350 to make the numbers easier to work with. But let's go ahead and continue using 350 for consistency. Uh, usually a speed of sound would be given, I would assume. If it's not given, I would expect about 345 is probably a better approximation, it, it, though it varies to some extent based on temperature of the day. Also, if you're writing anything, it stopped uh, showing up after the Doppler equation. I don't know. Uh, does oh, that make it visible? Yeah. OK, That's I guess while I'm typing it, it doesn't show up. But I'll just have to click out of it. OK, so we know frequency Bob hears. We know speed of sound. And we know the source's speed. The speed of the car itself. That was just 20 meters per second, right? So at this point, what's the only unknown left? Frequency of the car. Yeah, frequency of the car is the only unknown. So we can now solve for that. Simplifying a bit, 300 hertz equals frequency of the car times looks like 350 over 330 since the meters per second cancels out. In fact, we could even cancel out the zeros. 350 over 330 becomes 35 over 33. And then what's the only thing we need to do to solve for frequency of the car? How would we isolate that last unknown frequency? Multiply both sides by 33 over 35. Yeah, multiply by that reciprocal. And 335 are both multiples of five. So we could condense that to 60 and seven. So whatever that works out to. A little less than five, so a little less than 300. And that, that fits together. We should expect this to be a little bit less than the 300. And more specifically, 60 times 33 over seven, about 283. So this matches up with the idea, this matches up with the idea that uh, Bob, the frequency Bob hears is higher than the frequency actually created by the car. The car is emitting this frequency that's 283 hertz. Bob hears a higher pitch sound because of the Doppler effect. Any questions on that so far? And now that we know the frequency the car is producing, let's fill that in. Frequency car is 283 hertz. We can also figure out what other information. What else could we now figure out based on the available information? Uh, the frequency um, Alice hears. Yeah, because Alice is going to hear a different frequency since, first of all, the car is moving away from her, and also she's in motion as well. So we can now figure out what frequency does Alice perceive here. So let's try that out. So if we do, if we use the same Doppler equation, but at this point, the observer is now going to be Alice. And we can still call the car the source. Speed of sound is still going to be 350.
But what are we going to do differently? Oh, and the car is still moving at 20 meters per second. Alice, the observer, is moving at five meters per second. But how would we decide on the plus or minuses here? Since the car is moving away, now you would do um, the minus the observer over the plus the source. Yeah, because the fact that the car is moving away suggests we should get a larger or a smaller frequency. Car moving away means smaller frequency, so we want a larger denominator to make a smaller result. Also, if Alice is moving towards the car, uh, would she be hit by more wave more wave fronts per second or fewer wave fronts per second? More. As, yeah, if you're moving towards the source, you're running into those wave fronts, so you're going to intercept more wave fronts per second. So we should expect her speed to cause an increase in the frequency she hears. That suggests plus in the, in the numerator, because we want to make the numerator larger to get a larger result. So that should be plus as well. In fact, I think if, if you want a general rule there, it seems like the direction from the observer towards the source is the direction that's positive for both of these. But I think it's probably better to look at it in terms of the reasoning behind why it's plus or why it's minus. Since if you try to memorize a rule, you're probably going to forget the rule. That's my experience. But understanding why that rule works is usually a much better way to do it. But in this case, it looks like those are both plus. The numerator is plus because we want an increase. The denominator is plus because we want a decrease. And we also now know the frequency of the sound that the car emits. That is 283 hertz. Any questions on that so far? And it looks like in this case, there isn't really even any algebraic solving to do because frequency that Alice hears is already isolated on one side of the equation. We just take the 283 Hertz created by the car, multiply by, it looks like 355 over 375, since the meters per second cancel out. So 283 times 355 over 375, looks like about 268. All right, can you repeat why it's um, why you're adding on the numerator? Is it because Alice is moving towards the car? Uh, yeah, in the numerator, Alice is moving towards the car. And if she's moving towards the car, then she is getting hit by more wave fronts per second because she's running into those wave fronts. And more wave fronts per second okay. directly means a higher frequency. So conceptually, just from the geometry and motion of the situation, I would expect that Alice's motion, V observer, should lead to a higher result. And you get a higher result if, you, if your numerator is larger. So I would use plus in the numerator to make the result larger. Meanwhile, we're also using plus in the denominator to try and make the result smaller because the car moving away from the listener, source moving away from the listener, should result in a lower frequency. And so those are both those are both kind of competing. The car moving away from Alice suggests a lower frequency. Alice moving towards the car suggests a higher frequency. But those balance out to overall a lower frequency, in part because the car is moving faster than Alice. Any other questions on that one? Or any other questions on the Doppler effect in general? And you mentioned uh, superposition and interference earlier. What are you working on in terms of superposition? Uh, were there any um, specific situations about that you wanted to work on? Yeah, in that um, discussion, if you go forward two pages, I guess, um, mm -hmm. the one that was really hard was the last few questions. Um, so number three in activity 8.9. Okay. Um, and that was, so there's, they're basically floating in the water, I think. Um, right, the one with the lake. Yes.
Um, let's get the info back. I think what started getting confusing was um, figuring out because then you're working with constructive interference, I guess, in this case. Um, yeah. Is that this one? Is that visible now? Yes. Yeah. Specifically, number three was where it got trickier, I think. Where we want to know uh, Ann and Carla moving with the same frequency as each other and starting their motion at the same instant. So they're, they're both oscillating in sync with each other. They're both going up at the same time, both going down at the same time, and so on. And we want a wave press from each person to arrive at Bob at the same time. And also we know the distances from Carla to Bob is two meters, from Ann to Bob is four meters. And since we're talking about waves from Carla to Bob and from Ann to Bob, we don't really need to worry about the distance between Ann and Carla here. But also we wanna make sure that uh, Carla's wave and Anne's wave both reach Bob in the same sort of way, that they, Bob's receiving a crest from both at the same time. And presumably Bob is also receiving a trough from both at the same time. So what has to be true to make that happen? In order for Bob to get that constructive interference. It might help to look at this in terms of uh, the wave fronts as they spread out. Like, let's say we're taking a look at the wave fronts from Carlo's wave. Those would basically be shaped like circles centered around Carlo's location, all spaced equally out from each other. And let's say we want to make sure that Bob is currently getting hit by a crest from Car from Carla, and also a crest from Anne. And we're assuming that these are the same wavelength as each other, because they're the same frequency and same velocity since they're in the same medium. Not big enough. I'm not really doing a good job of spacing these even. Let me see if I can correct that. That's better. You know, I think the one feature Zoom needs more than anything else is being able to say, draw a circle that is centered at this point and has this radius. That should be centered on every graphics program. Okay, so let's say that uh, we've worked it out such that they are both creating crests that hit Bob at the same time. In a case like that, where Bob is being hit by a crest from both sources at the same time, what would you expect to be happening at Bob's location as a result of those two crests? If you've got one high point and another high point reaching the same location, what's gonna happen there? But throughout this will be twice the amplitude if they have the same um, amplitude. Yeah, if those amplitudes combine, that part of the water is going to go really high. Yeah. Likewise, if you have two troughs, that's going to create a really low point. It's going to combine to a very large trough. So we call that constructive interference in the sense that the waves are interfering with each other in a way that constructs an even larger crest, an even larger trough. And that's going to be true any point where you've got troughs, crests overlapping with crests, 
and also in the in-between zones where you got troughs overlapping with troughs. All those locations will be constructive interference. Whereas destructive interference would be if you've got crest overlapping with trough or vice versa. So for example, uh, this location here and this location here, those in-between points where you got crest and trough overlapping, those would be dead zones. That's where the crest and trough cancel each other out. And so you get effectively flat water there. That one location would be staying still while the points around it oscillate up and down. Uh, but we want Bob to be at a point where there's constructive interference. Any questions on that so far? So let me tidy this up a little bit. We're focusing on just Bob's location. And we want to make sure that we get the same type of, of point here. It doesn't have to be crest and crest. It could be trough and trough, or it could be equilibrium on the way down and another equilibrium on the way down, or equilibrium on the way up and another equilibrium on the way up. The important thing is it's the same type of point on the wave. And if we take a look at Carla's wave and Anne's wave, what's really the only difference between them? Carla and Anne, they're both creating waves of the same frequency, same wavelength, presumably same amplitude. What's the only difference between the waves they're creating? If we go back to the uh, wave equation. Let me pull that up. If we go back to that wave equation we've been working with, in that equation, is there any term, any parameter within this that would be different if we compare Carlos wave and Anne's wave? Yeah, X is different because X represents distance traveled from the source to the, in this case, to Bob. The waves are traveling different distances. The wave from Carla traveling towards Bob travels two meters. The wave from Anne traveling towards Bob travels four meters. So the path lengths are different. They have different values of X, but it looks like everything else is the same. They arrive at the same time. The waves have the same period and same wavelength. They even have the same phase shift because the two people are bobbing up and down at the same time in sync with each other. And I think we can assume same amplitude as well. But also what aspect of the function, what aspect of this function determines what type of point you're at? Like if you want to know, are you at a crest? Or are you at a trough? What's the only part of this function you have to care about? Period? Not just the period, because the period tells you how much time one full cycle takes. But let's say you know a certain XT coordinate and you want to know, is that XT coordinate a, a crest or a trough or equilibrium or what? What's the only part of this equation you need in order to tell, is it a crest or a trough? or something else. The total phase? Yeah, if you take a look at the total phase, just the stuff inside the sine function, you can ignore everything else. Just looking at the total phase, if you calculate the total phase and find that it's, for instance, pi over two, you know you're at a crest. Or if it's uh, three pi over two, you know you're at a trough. So we can focus on just the total phase of Carlos wave and the total phase of Anne's wave if they're the same value, we know that the same type of point is reaching Bob at the same time. If they're different values, then maybe it's a different type of point. So let's focus on that total phase. And in particular, we don't really even need to know what the total phase is. We can take a look at the difference in total phase. So if we write out the difference in total phase, uh, if we just apply a delta to each one of these, we're going to get, let me just copy that out. If we apply a delta to each of these, oh, also, if the waves are moving outwards, should we use plus or minus here?
as the wave moves outwards, would you say its distance from the source is increasing or decreasing? Increase. Yeah, it's moving outward, so that's increasing distance from the source. I would treat that as the positive direction. So we should use minus in the equation here. And that will generally always be the case for a two or three dimensional wave. If you got a wave that's spreading out in space from some source in two or three dimensions, it's always moving outwards from the source. So that's moving in the positive direction. So we'll use a negative in the equation. Also in terms of what's not changing. Uh, also, instead of divided by period, it's usually easier to write this as times frequency. So let's just write that as two pi times frequency times time. Is there any difference in the frequencies of the waves? That is Carlos wave versus Ann's wave. No, they're the same frequency. And of course, they're both arriving at Bob's location at the same time. So this whole term is gonna be zero. So we can drop that out. And what about the two pi x over lambda term? Is anything in that different if we compare Ann's wave and Carla's wave? Yeah, position is different. Or I, I would say not so much position because Bob is just at one position, but the distance traveled, the path length. Because that's really what x represents in cases like this. X represents how far has the wave traveled. So that's different. There is a difference in x, but two pi is the same for both waves because that's just a constant. And also they both have the same wavelength. So we can write this with uh, essentially just two pi times delta x over lambda. Because the two pi is a constant, so we can pull it out of the delta. Lambda is a constant, so we can pull it out of the delta. There is a difference in path length though. And what is that difference in path length? What's the difference between Carlos' path and Anne's path? Two meters. Yeah, four meters minus two meters is two meters. And we could say two meters or negative two meters, depending on which direction we're subtracting. So generally you wanna choose an order to subtract and stick with it. And what about phase shift? Is there any difference in phase constant between the two waves? No. It told us that they started jumping up and down at the same instant. Uh, phase shift difference would be if they're out of sync with each other. Like maybe Carla hits a crest and then Anne hits a crest. Carla hits a crest, then Anne hits a crest at different times. But if they're both oscillating in sync, they both create a crest at the same time, both create a trough at the same time, there's no difference in phase shift. So that's gonna be zero. And also, so it looks like the difference in total phase is just two pi delta x over lambda. And I think we can ignore the negative as well because the negative is just talking about which order you're subtracting in. And if you just got one term, it doesn't really matter whether it's positive or negative. But we want these to be in total in phase with each other. We want them to both be a crest or both be a trough hitting Bob at the same time. So what has to be true about that total phase difference in order for it to be the same type of point, so both crests or both troughs? For example, what if there was no difference? If the two total phases were exactly the same value, what would that suggest? Like if the total phase from Anne's wave and the total phase from Carlos' wave were the same value, so there's no difference. What would that tell you about the waves as they hit Bob? If the two waves are exactly the same the whole way, what's happening when they hit Bob? Oh, they collide and they're just like super big. Yeah, you're gonna get some uh, amplitude. Both crests, so it'd be a very large crest or both troughs, so it'd be a very large trough. Yeah. If there's no difference at all, then you definitely get constructive interference. But also what other difference would still lead to the same type of point? Like how much can you add or subtract to an angle that doesn't really change its angular value? A full 
like 360 degrees or 2 pi? Or yeah, 2 pi in radians. If the two waves are offset by exactly one full cycle, like let's say you've got two waves and they're in sync, but then you offset one of them by a whole cycle. Let me put this one. So you take this wave, offset it by one whole cycle. This crest now lines up with the next crest on the other wave. So if they're offset by a whole cycle, two pi, or two whole cycles, four pi, or three whole cycles, six pi, any whole number of cycles offset is still gonna be constructive interference. So if we want constructive interference, we can set the total phase difference equal to either zero or any multiple of two pi. Let's say two pi times n, where n is just some whole number. Any questions on that so far? So let's see if we can simplify that. Like I said, I'm going to ignore the negative in this context because that just represents which, which order we're subtracting in. The important thing is to be consistent about the order you're subtracting in. So we get 2 pi times delta x, uh, where we know it's constructive interference. In this case, we know it's constructive interference because the problem specifically said we wanted a crest from each wave, so Anne's crest and Carlo's crest, to hit Bob's location at the same time. So Bob gets a very large combined crest. And that idea of the same type of point hitting the location at the same time to create a very large version of that type of point, that's what's meant by constructive interference. So we can set that equal to two pi n, because that means offset by a whole number of cycles. And I think uh, if we take a look at like a side view of the wave, that might be more, more easier to see what's going on here. Let's say you've got a wave that's shaped, let's say we took, take a look at the side view of the water. And let's say we've also got another wave that's the exact same amplitude and frequency, exact same everything. So right now, these two waves as shown, what kind of interference would that be? Constructive. Yeah, we got crest and crest lining up to make a very large crest, trough and trough lining up to very, a very large trough. But let's say I shift one of the waves by half a cycle. Now what type of interference do we have? Destructive. Yeah, crest and trough lining up cancel each other out, or at least partly cancel out. So that would be destructive interference but if I keep shifting this, if I shift it exactly one whole cycle, one whole cycle offset is now what kind of interference? Constructive. So right, just that gets back to constructive again. Or if I shift it two whole cycles or three whole cycles, any whole number of cycles, we still have crest and crest lining up. So that's still gonna count as constructive interference. And since a whole number of cycles in radians is two pi, we can say the total difference in phase, the total phase difference of the whole thing has to be a whole number times two pi in order to get constructive interference. So let's write that out as an equation. So two pi delta x over lambda, the difference in phase just because of the, the difference in path length has to equal two pi times a whole number. And we're trying to solve for a lambda here, I think, right? Because we know the difference in path length. What could we cancel out from this, by the way? Two pi. Yeah, the two pi's can cancel out just by dividing both sides by two pi. So we're left with delta x over lambda, or we can even multiply both sides by lambda. So that means to get constructive interference in this situation, the difference in path length, which in this case we know is two meters, has to be a whole number times the wavelength. And that should generally be true as long as the difference in path length is the only difference. If everything else about the waves is identical, same wavelength, same frequency, arriving at the same time, no difference in phase constant. So they're in the sources are in sync with each other. 
If the only difference is that the waves are traveling different distances to get to the, sort, the, the observer, then you get constructive interference when the difference in path length is a whole number of wavelengths. In this case, though, we know the difference in path length. We're trying to find what wavelength would work here. So how would you solve this for wavelength? Change in X over N. Yeah. And we know difference in X is two meters. So we can take two meters and divide by what kind of number does N have to be? An even number? Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be even. The evenness is already built into the times two in the two pi. But the N was supposed to be the number of cycles offset. That could be any whole number of cycles. So we could, because the, the constructive requirement here is the difference in path length is some whole number of wavelengths. If we're dividing by N, that just means dividing by any whole number. So the, the delta X, that was the two meters of difference. We could take two meters divided by one or two meters divided by two, two meters divided by three, two meters over four, two meters over five. Two meters divided by any whole number will work as a wavelength here. So there's, I think it mentioned in the, in the problem, there's many possible answers. In fact, infinitely many, two, pi, or two meters divided by any whole number. But I think it's just asking you for one. So you could just take two meters divided by any whole number you want, and that should work as a wavelength. Any other questions on that? All right, then we can look into more examples of interference and superposition next time. Superposition, by the way, just means you've got two things happening at the same location and you can add together the results in the sense that we're adding together what's one wave is doing plus what the other wave is doing. And then interference is the wave specific result of that. Uh, so we'll look into more examples of that next time. Feel free to email me or send me messages on Discord if you want to request any topics for next time. And I will see you then. Thank you so much. Really helpful. Yeah, you're welcome.